But light in the darkness, oh my God, that is who you are. I want you to turn with me now to Joshua and chapter 20. Our key passage for today, we're going to read verses 1 to 6 from Joshua chapter 20. Now, if you brought your smart device with you, feel free to pull it out, okay? We're not like that kind of church saying, oh, you know, if you don't have a real Bible. No, that's, that's a real Bible. I use, in fact, I'm using an iPad now. Okay, so go ahead. Oh, you've got it on the screen today. Thank you so much for the effort that's gone into it. I really appreciate that. So you can follow with me from the New Living Translation. The Lord said to Joshua... Now tell the Israelites to designate cities of refuge, as I instructed Moses. Anyone who kills another person, look at this word, accidentally and unintentionally, can run to one of these cities. They will be places of refuge from relatives seeking revenge for the person who was killed. Upon reaching one of these cities, the one who caused the death will appear before the elders of the city gate and present his case. They must allow him to enter the city and give him a place to live among them. If the relatives of the victim come to avenge the killing... And if you've got the King James Version, there was a name for them. They were called the Avenger of Blood. The leaders must not release the slayer to them, for he killed the other person unintentionally and without previous hostility. But the slayer must stay in that city and be tried by the local assembly, which will render a judgment. And he must continue to live in that city until the death of the high priest who was in office at the time of the accident. After that, he is free to return to his own home in the town from which he fled. Now, without any context, it's very hard to try and understand this passage of Scripture. Because it seems to be a far cry from the laws that are enacted in our time. In fact, laws that were established, which is called common law in our nation, actually came from common law in England. That's why it's called common law. The Americans have adopted a common law. But over the years, that law has been changed. Now, that common law was based on the laws that Israel was given. Because we needed to know a compass between what is right and what is wrong? Because if a man wrote the laws, there's a problem. It will always have a flaw if a man wrote the law. Why? Because man will lack the foresight to see the effect of the law they make for future generations. And there's also going to be another flaw because what happens is that law will be open to personal agenda. You know, if that particular king or that prime minister wanted something to make money or whatever reason they had, they can put a law together. And that would be unfair. It would be biased. There would be favoritism. And so in order for that not to happen, and never before in history or since then has this happened, where God comes down and dictates to men, here's the law. The guy, the person, the uncreated one that created you, and they created me, said, this is the law. It is unbiased. No man has written it. God, the creator, wrote this for you and I. But here's the thing that I want you to grab hold of from the law that God gives us. When God gave the law, it wasn't just for the rich and wealthy. He wasn't, there was no favoritism. In fact, it wasn't written just for mankind, or just for men. It was written for women. It was written for slaves. In fact, uh, as I was teaching an Exodus class, God even thought about the animals. Even animals had right. Can you believe that? God thought of it all. In fact, if you read the chapter before, the Bible explains what these accidental or unintentional murder, uh, killing was like. And he t talks about how some men go into the forest, they've got their axes, they're chopping down trees, when all of a sudden the axe head falls off the guy's axe handle and strikes another man and kills him. 
So a bit of perspective for you. Now, you remember the law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Does everyone know that law? Okay. Now, how many people believe that that was a nasty, mean law? Okay, we got one, two, a few hands gone up. Okay, how many people believe it was the grace of God? If you've been in my Exodus class, your hand would have gone up already. So the rest of you guys are like, I don't know if they commit yes or no because I'm, <laughs> I'm going to get it wrong. I want to make sure because pastor plays the game. Here's the thing. It was gracious. It was grace. Why do I say that? Because back in the day, if you were in a fight and you punched someone's tooth out, they could come and kill you. That's not fair. So God says, an eye for an eye, okay, you gouge the guy's out, you gouge his eye out. If he punches your tooth, you punch his tooth, but you don't do any more than that. Does, it, does that make sense? In fact, the implication wasn't that you were literally saying, okay, you punch my tooth, you stand there, it's my turn. No, that never happened. There was usually a compensation that took place. So someone would have to go out of pocket and pay them for the damage. They did not literally follow an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Does that make sense? Now you can begin to see that even in the Old Testament, it's the same God. There's this incredible grace. But here's the thing. I began digging a little bit deeper. The expositor's Bible commentary states that in the case of any death where there was a, a loss of blood, shedding of blood, a capital punishment is prescribed in all cases of murder. Okay, where there is loss of life, there has to be a life that is lost. And it was the duty and the right of the family and a designated family member to take the life of the person that took the life of your family. That person was called an avenger of blood. Everyone with me so far? Okay, so, but here's a problem. Although all the other nations of the world agreed to that law, it was an unwritten law, they all knew that. If you hurt my family, if you kill that person, we're going to come get you. And we have a right to, and everyone understood the law. Except, here's the thing, in Israelite law, with its high view of the sanctity of human life, it was strictly prohibited to use monetary compensation for the loss of life. So back in that day, people would also try and pay. So eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Well, I don't want you to break my tooth. How about I give you some money? What do you think's fair? And they'd give it. In all the other cultures of that day, they would also pay the price for a life. How would that be calculated? They would look at how much the guy earned, and over a lifetime, they would calculate that. That's what they had to pay that person. But among the Israelites, they could not do that because human life was regarded the most sanctified above all other, all other living beings. That's how God sees you. We're talking about babies. We're talking about abortion. And we're saying there is no safe place. Well, God designated a safe place as we read this passage here. Very interesting. So God ends up saying, I want you to, to designate six places. Remember, six is the number of man. I don't know if you know the numbers, right? Six is the number of man. There are six cities that are places of refuge. So that person, he's just chopping wood. He has no intent to kill. He's actually working with his mate. And the axe head falls off the handle, and he strikes a guy and kills him. He is now in trouble. He doesn't even have enough time to go home and tell his family because the news would go out. He needs enough distance to start traveling because the avenger of blood will come out for his life. And so here's some key thoughts that I want you to grab hold of. Okay, so take some notes today. I've I got four key things, four key lessons. Here's the first one. When God decided where to put the cities of refuge... He was so careful that he made sure that there was enough cities within close location that every person who does, again, unintentional death, was able to escape to because it was close enough to access. So here's the first one. Refuge had to be easy to access. Now have a think about this. How often have you made it difficult when someone wronged you for you to forgive them. You know, that person that hurt you, and you just, you know, and you try. Sometimes we have this uh, in our marriage sometimes. sometimes, 
and you know, and you need to crawl, gentlemen. Can I just say this to all the husbands out there? Learn to crawl. Just, you know, maybe put some padding on there. But you, you just learn. I'm just going to demonstrate for you. Sorry, I can't see this on the film. But I, I practice really hard, you know. And I, I have special gear that I can just walk. And I just crawl. <laughs> she knows I'm making this stuff up. But I, I'm telling you, gentlemen, and those of you that are, you know, single, just get ready with your knees. But you need to go to your woman and be able to make things right because she is going to make you crawl. And let me just say for those, and this is just goes, this is just not just for ladies, I'm just kidding, but in real life, this is what we do. We want to be forgiven instantly. I didn't mean to do it. You should forgive me. But when it comes time for you to forgive that other person, what do we expect them to do? We will not be happy until they crawl for miles on their hands and feet on broken glass, shutting out, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. How many people know what I'm talking about? Some of you are like, what is this foreign concept? I would never do that. Turn to the person next to you and say, God knows. Husbands and wives, you need to look at each other in the eyeball. God knows, honey. <laughs> A couple married for 15 years began having more than usual disagreements. They're getting upset. They're getting angry. They're arguing every single day. That's you. Don't look at your spouse right now. Look at me. All eyes on me. So for one month, they planned a fault box. Okay? This might be a good idea. A fault box. It was her idea, by the way. And here's what you're supposed to do. Every time there was an irritation, every time your spouse did something nasty to you, you write it down on a piece of paper and you put it in the box. And at the end of the month, you would open the box, divvy them out, and you begin to read them so you know all the faults that led to the arguments and the trouble. How many people think that's a good idea? How many ladies think that's a good idea in the church? Uh, some of them got their hands up. The husband was like, not funny, honey. Put the, put the hand down. Put your hand down. Here's it. They opened up the note. They divvied them out. And the wife, she was diligent in her efforts and approach. First note, left the toilet seat up. Not looking at anyone. Wet towels on the shower floor. Next one. Dirty socks not in hamper. <laughs> Bench not wiped. <laughs> Shall I keep going? Are you feeling uncomfortable? All right, you go. Dishwasher not run. On and on it happened, right? As she's reading through. But then the wife opened her box. And began reading. They were all the same. Each message on every slip of paper, I love you. <laughs> if you could just hear the conversation. It has to be easy to access. I, I want to be forgiven. And that's the reason why if I, if I want God to forgive me, I have to have a capacity inside myself that when someone wrongs me, I can let it go. That if I'm offended because of something someone did, that I have the capacity as a mature man of God to be able to let it go. Because I am capable of the same offense. I will offend someone. And if I can't forgive you early, then I don't deserve to be forgiven early. Oh, you guys are quiet. That was that moment there. You're like, preach, pastor, because you want to be forgiven. Here's the second key case. So these are four key lessons about these places of refuge. You ready? Second one, present your case. The Bible tells us that every person who had unintentionally killed someone, they were running to the places of refuge because you didn't know if you'd make it. Because if you didn't make it to the place of refuge and the avenger blood caught up, they could kill you. And so you needed to hustle. That's why I said, you don't have time to go home. You can't pack your bag. You are running literally for your life. But when you got there, you have to acknowledge the sin to be able to access the city of refuge safely. Refugees were not granted access without first sitting trial. And so Temporary access was given. 
until they could hear your case. In other words, you were innocent at the city of refuge before proven guilty. How many people in that argument, you're already saying, oh, no, you did it. You are guilty. <laughs> you know, I know what you did. I got a whole bag full of stuff that you did. I can talk about this. This is your behavior patterns. This is what you said last summer. But it's being able to just come forward and say, look, here's what happened. Someone got killed along the way, and I'm sorry, but I didn't do it. So temporary access is given, and you are innocent before proven guilty. So your case is first tried in a court of law by the elders of the city that would sit at the city gate. There were even chairs set aside for them to hear cases. That's where they had court. And here's a thought I want you to understand. They were sifted out. It was a question and answer time to examine their motives, to examine what was in their heart, to examine the evidence in order for them to com come to a verdict. And I want to tell you, here's the absolute truth. One day we too will stand before the presence of the living God, the judge of heaven and earth, to give an account of our lives. And the question is, how will you go when you are tested and questioned. I, I like watching Ray Comfort from Living Waters Ministry. How many people have heard of Ray Comfort? Okay, a few of you. Ray Comfort has a unique ministry. And when he leads someone to the Lord, it is different from most other methods. He believes firmly that if you don't know what you're saved from, how can you possibly appreciate what you are saved to? See, a lot of Christians, they play with their Christian walk. They don't mind sinning. Of course, I'm not talking about anybody here, but I'm talking about the person next to you. Turn to the person next to you and say, hey, no, don't do that. Look at me. Look at me. But we think to ourselves, it's okay. It's a little sin. I can get away with it because, you know, the blood of Jesus forgives me anyway. So I'm just going to sin here and now, and then later on I can just ask for forgiveness. It's going to be okay. Willingly wanting to sin or willingly allowing a sin to enter our lives. So Ray Comfort confronts all kinds of people, atheists and the like, and he confronts Christians. And he asks them this question, how many lies have you told in your life? Of course, they're flabbergasted. <laughs> I can't keep count. There were too many. Have you ever stolen something that didn't belong to you? Oh, no, absolutely not. Did you download that illegal music? Did you download that movie that you weren't supposed to online? Did you watch it with a friend because they stole it? And mm. Have you ever used the Lord's name in vain? Have you ever looked with lust at someone? Magazine? Movie? Jesus said, if you... If you lusted in your heart, you've already committed adultery or fornication if you're not yet married. Have you ever hated anybody? Some of you look at me like, oh, no, I'm perfect. I've never hated anybody. Don't look at me like that. I know you. Turn to the person next to you. Make, keep it real. Just say, God knows you. <laughs> Turn around speak to the person behind you and say, God knows you. Huh? <laughs> Because the thing, we preach, we're thinking to ourselves, oh, no, I'm safe in my chair. He's up there. He's taking all the heat. I'm not taking all the heat. I'm taking, giving you the heat. We got the heat coming on. Here's the thing that's interesting. So he says to them, of course, they're owning up. They, of course, I've done that. I've done all these things. He says, okay, by your own admission, you were lying, thieving, blasphemous, murdering, adulterer at heart. And when you stand before the King of kings and the Lord of lords, when you die, as all people will, it is appointed for men to die once and then face judgment. How do you think you're going to go at questioning time? But I, but I gave my life to Jesus. I said all these things. Yeah, but you willfully sinned against God. If you don't know what you're being saved from, how can you appreciate what you're being saved to? Here's the thing. Romans 6.23 says this. For the wages of sin is death. It goes on to say that all men have sinned. There's not one person that hasn't sinned. So if you sat here and you said, no, that wasn't me, then you already lied. 
<laughs> so it means you're a sinner. And the Bible says you break one law, you break them all. Like, oh my goodness. We're in, the, we're in a good place here right now, okay? Are we family? Is this okay? We're all comfortable right now. You're feeling, whoo, I'm feeling some heat right now. A little bit of hell going on there. Someone turn down the air conditioner, just keep it going. But when Jesus hung on the cross, and he's just there hanging in extreme agony. I was explaining to my children what it looked like. As you're hanging by a nail in your wrist, because the Romans considered that part of your hand, there's two bones on either side. The bone stuck, the nail stuck in between the bone. They're hanging, Jesus is hanging by a nail in his wrist, both wrists, and his two feet are, are nailed together. Again, it didn't break bone. It went right through into the thing. We're talking big, long pieces of nail, and he's gyrating between trying to breathe and pop up, and the pain excruciating in his feet and then dropping down to release the pain a little bit and shift it from the feet to the arm, and it's an ex exhaustive moment with every breath when he utters. Some of you are thinking when Jesus says, you know, woman, behold your son. Son, behold your woman. Every time Jesus says something, you think he's just comfortably sitting on the cross, you know, you know, no, no, he's, he's gasping for breath, he's, he's pulling himself up, knowing I, I'm going to have excruciating pain shooting up through my feet, I'm going to push on my feet so I can give my hands a break and take a breath, and he's saying, Father, forgive them, Whew, down again, he can't breathe, pulling up again, because they don't know what they're doing, and down he goes again in pain and agony, he can barely breathe, and he's speaking these things out, why did he say that? He's saying, Father, pardon them for their sins. They're not even aware they're doing it. Give them a break. I'll take it. I'll take the punishment. I was sharing with some people and saying, when Jesus died on that cross, he didn't just die for you. He died as you. He was you on that cross. Every sin that you've ever committed in your lifetime, in fact, every sin you're going to commit because you will sin some more, Jesus saw it all. He took it on that cross. He says, I'll take it all for them. A place of refuge. That's why the Bible says, oh my goodness, Psalm chapter 46, verses 1 to 2, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when the earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea because God took it all. Someone needs to put that right now in your notes. Hashtag God took it all. Here's key number three that we learn. Your, I love this one. Your enemy is denied access. <laughs> yes. you, you, hold on. Get this one. You said, sort of like, of course it is. No, no. Your enemy is denied access to you. The devil cannot have a foothold in your life because if you put it all under the blood, when you ask for forgiveness for your sins, the devil can't touch you. Yes. Some of you are still living like you're sinners. And you haven't quite figured out, no, you are redeemed. This is old words. We used to sing these songs. Some of you guys don't know what I'm talking about. We are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. First song I ever learned to sing a duet with my sister. I am redeemed, I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Are you all looking at me like, that's so old. Your enemy is denied access. The Bible says that in the book of Job, that even Satan himself had to come with all the other angels. Remember, he's not an equal to God. Get your theology right. He is not an equal to God. He's one of many angels. Powerful, but one of many. <laughs> one of. And he has to stand before God, cap in hand, and give an accounting for his time. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? And the devil says, well, no, Lord, because you put a hedge of protection around him. I can't touch his finances. I can't touch his health. I can't touch his life. I can't touch his family. Come on, you are very quiet. That's what God has over your life. There's a hedge of protection. Some of you guys have got a husband or a wife who's a Christian. You may not be saved. Their protection goes on you. Ah, oh, come on. That's pretty awesome. Erwin Lutzer is an evangelical Christian speaker, radio broadcaster, and author. And he was a former senior pastor of the Moody Church, the one that Dwight D.L. Moody planted. Big, big church. But he writes his book, Putting Your Past Behind You, where he records the history of Robert Bruce of Scotland. In the 14th century, he was leading his men in a battle 
to gain independence from England. And near the end of the conflict, the English wanted to capture Bruce to keep him from the Scottish crown. So they put his own bloodhounds on their master's trail. And when the bloodhounds got close, Bruce could hear their baying. And his attendant said, we're done for. They're on your trail, and they will reveal your hiding place. And Bruce replied, it's all right. Then he headed for a stream that flowed through the forest. He plunged into that stream and waded upstream a short distance. And when he came out the other side of the bank, he was in the depths of a forest. Within minutes, the hounds, tracing their master's steps, came to the bank. And they went no further. The English soldiers are urging, him on, urging them on, but the trail was broken. The stream had carried the scent far away. And a short time later, the crown of Scotland rested on the head of Robert Bruce. You see, the memory of your sins, the things that you did, are covered under the blood. That's like that stream. And though the hounds of hell, the avenger of blood, comes to get you, he can't get you because you're in a place of refuge. You cannot be touched. You get this thing here? Some of you still thinking, the devil's on the doorstep. He's waiting for me. No, he can't be. He's got to stay away from you. It's a DVO. <laughs> the enemy can't come next to you. Certain kilometers away, they can't touch you. That's why they're like, oh, razzle frazzle. Every time you come around, you know, here comes trouble again. No, we can't come near him. Stay away. Give him wide berth because they can't touch you. Does it change your theology all of a sudden when you recognize you walk in authority? Everywhere you go, there's an embassy of the kingdom because the devil can't come near you. They can't touch you. Whew. The devil is denied access. Here's point number four. I'm going to close with this. If I can get Katie to come up. Number four, remain in the place of refuge. The Bible says that that person who has now been granted refuge in a city of refuge is allowed to remain there until the high priest dies. And once the high priest dies, a high priest of Israel, he's allowed to go back to his family. But sometimes it might be a young high priest. He'll never make it. He'll have to remain in that place the rest of his life. But the moment he tries to set foot outside of the city of refuge, the avenger of blood will come to take him down. It's interesting how as people of God, we are forgiven of our sins, but there's a mentality in church where we think it's okay to go back to our own sins. It's like being that person who's gone through all that rigmarole. You ran for your life. You're crawling all the way to the city of refuge. You made it through the gates, and you're safe for a period of time. You were tried before a court of law, question and answer. They saw the motives of the heart. They realized he is innocent. He needs to remain in the city. He fairly and squarely belongs in this place. And the avenger of blood is not even allowed to visit the city. I'm just visiting the city. No, you're not. You are not allowed in a city of refuge. But the moment you step foot outside that city, the avenger of blood is allowed legally to come and strike you dead. My son yesterday, after five years, five long years, <laughs> I love soccer, played it my entire life. And he's only just got it now. He loves to play. He looks forward to playing the game. And I've never seen this boy play like he did yesterday. He took the ball and he winged it like a champion, dragging that back foot behind. He said, Dad, did you teach me that? I said, no, I taught you to do the other way. That's your coach. He taught you that. Pastor Tim Sparks from Central Church, he was our coach. He taught him, drag your left, your left leg behind you, your right leg behind you, so you don't lift your legs. And he threw it. It was amazing. He takes the ball, and he's dribbling past one defender coming against him. He moves to the other side. He goes the other side. And then he comes to, I think, oh, this is happening before my eyes. I can't believe this. My son is coming towards the goal. The goalkeeper is going for him. And then he kicks the ball, not straight at the goalkeeper. He kicks it away from the goalkeeper straight into the goal. I said, go!
What you didn't see before that was he was ducking in and out and going offside. So I was saying to him, son, stay on the line. Stay on the line. I don't know if he heard me, but he's hearing me today. Son, stay on the line. Because if you cross the halfway mark past the fullbacks, you've actually gone offside. And you can lose. He could have lost that kick that he did. After all that effort, moving from one player to another, coming to the goalkeeper, faking out the goalkeeper, getting a goal in there, it could have been lost because he was offside. Can I challenge you as a man of God? As a woman of God, listen to these words. Stay on the line. Stay on the line.